I'm Stacy Kilb. I'm the Asian Longhorn Beetle Outreach Coordinator for the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. This is Kai Thompson. He's with the USDA APHIS Asian Longhorn Beetle Eradication Program. So he can answer some specific questions about surveying the area, anything else you might have too that um, I can't answer. So today we'll be talking about two forest pests, the Asian Longhorn Beetle and the Emerald Ash Borer. Thankfully, you guys don't um, have either of those here or at least they haven't been found. We'd like to keep it that way, so we definitely need your help in um, spreading the word of that. So you might know that Asian longhorn beetle is an introduced pest, as the name implies. It's native to Asia. It's a longhorn beetle in the Cerambicidae family, and the scientific name is Anoplophora glabra pennis. Glabrous means shiny, and pennis means wing. So you can see here that the beetle has very shiny wing covers, so that's where that name comes from. And it does attack hardwood trees by boring through the wood, and they have had to cut down more than 34,000 trees in the Worcester area because of this beetle um, since its discovery. So Asian longhorn beetle affects all of us on a couple of different levels. On a local level, for example, your backyard or school, park, um, things like that, trees provide lots of shade, and we lose that if we don't have them, um, and there's an economic impact there too, which I'll outline in another slide. They actually also provide very good um, noise barriers. When you lose them, you don't really realize how good of a noise barrier they are until they're gone. And they provide wildlife habitat. So even in an urban setting, trees have value for wildlife. So those squirrels and those birds that would um, live in the trees need somewhere else to go, so they could very well wind up in your attic, your gutters, um, if they have nowhere else to go. On a regional level, we would lose all of the income from all those leaf peepers that come here in the fall for tourism. Um, maple is Asian longhorn beetle's favorite host tree, so the maple syrup industry is very concerned about this pest. Um, if you think about the various <coughs> schools and parks and historical homes in town here, if you picture them without big old trees, the character of them, the very nature of that sense of place you get would just be vastly different. And of course, the people who make their living off of the trees, the ones who work in the timber and nursery industries would be impacted by um, loss of the trees. So this is a before and after shot. Um, this is Glenville Ave, I believe, in Worcester. Um, so all of these trees on this street were Norway maples. So they were planted in the 70s. They grew fast, they were majestic. You get that nice canopy closing over the street pretty fast. But the problem is when you plant a monoculture like that and something comes along that they are susceptible to, you wind up having to remove every single street tree, which is what happened here. Um, having said that, what do you notice is still in the background? Conifers. Yeah. Asian longhorn beetle does not attack conifers or softwoods. Um, the striking thing is, is that all of these trees could have been removed potentially in one day. It doesn't take them that long to come in. They have a crane, they loop a chain around the top of the tree, um, use a chainsaw to cut it at the bottom, lift it up, and they feed it through a chipper, and that's it. So you could leave in the morning with your street looking like this and come home in the afternoon to it looking like this. I once had a resident of a, an area that was really hit hard like this tell me that he had to give his elderly neighbor directions to her house because she could no longer recognize the neighborhood when she came home from the senior center. So this does impact people on a very real level. So just to drive the point home, um, if you were talking to somebody who didn't appreciate trees just for their inherent and intrinsic value, they actually do have an economic value. So a 45 inch diameter sugar maple tree, for example, every year will sequester 810 pounds of carbon. It will prevent another 630 pounds from ever being emitted. Um, it will avoid certain different um, noxious things from being deposited. It will intercept almost 8,000 gallons of storm water over the course of the year. It'll increase your property value by about $55 and it will save you almost a combined $200 in natural gas, electricity, and storm water charges that you would have to pay or the city would otherwise just have to pass on to you. So trees are actually worth money. So you might be wondering how the Asian longhorn beetle got here. Again, as the name implies, it did come over here from uh, Asia. It was in infested hardwood packaging materials like pallets and spools and crates. 
So those are on the boat. It has a very long life cycle. So in the larval form, it just stays in those materials and then um, hatches out, bores out of the wood when it gets here and infests the nearest host tree. So what are we doing about it from that respect? Well, since 1998, the USDA amended its regulations so that all of this solid wood packing material must be fumigated or heat treated. These stamps here um, indicate that the wood has been treated. Is this a total foolproof system? Not really, which is why we still need people to um, be serving. But it has definitively cut down on um, new introductions of pests coming from other countries. So the infestations in, in North America, um, so far, the first detection was in Brooklyn in 1996. It was declared eradicated from Manhattan and Staten Island last year, but then a new infestation just outside of the one in um, Long Island was um, also found with an extension. So that's kind of unfortunate. Um, it's also been found in New Jersey, Ontario, Canada, uh, Illinois and Chicago, and Ohio in 2011. Uh, Chicago was found in 1998 and declared eradicated a decade later in 2008. So it takes a long time to eradicate, and we'll talk about why in a little, in a little while. Um, here in Massachusetts, it was found in Worcester in 2008, discovered in Boston in 2010, and as Kai mentioned earlier, um, it was actually, we had an eradication ceremony in Boston on Monday. So we are very, very excited about that. Um, it's a big success story. It really only was about four years from the time we found it till the time we could declare eradication, which is pretty unheard of in, in a time frame like that. And we'll discuss why there too. So would anybody like to hazard a guess as to what this yellow area represents on the map? Maples? Mm-hmm, exactly. This is our maple forest. As you can see, the Worcester infestation is kind of a gateway. So if Asian longhorn beetle makes it out into our sort of wild, non-urban, unmanaged, well, they may be managed, but this open forest area, it's going to be a disaster. Um, so we are, we can definitely eradicate it. It's been done before, we'll do it again. Um, it's just, Worcester is, is pretty much crucial um, to that effort to keeping it from spreading there. So it's a kind of disaster. Do maples go way north in Canada? Yeah. They get way, way north. Yeah, it's not, um, it's not on this map because this is just a US map, yeah. but I mean, obviously in Ontario, there was an infestation there. Um, but how far north would the maples go? I'm not entirely certain. Do you? Yeah. There was another map, and they go quite far north, at least as high as up mm. Maine and further. Yeah, and I mean, anywhere there are host trees, you can find they're the beetle. Vast maple forest, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so obviously, they're kind of concerned too. Um, they would very much like to um, eradicate. So they did actually eradicate. Again, took them a decade, but then they found another infestation. So we're trying desperately to avoid that situation in Worcester. Um, they're being very, very thorough, very, very careful, making sure that that regulated area, which I'll discuss in a few more slides, is as accurate as it can possibly be. Um, there's other efforts going on too. So we don't want to declare and then, you know, have an oops. So we'll, we'll get there eventually. Um, actually, while I'm still here, what do you notice that most of these places where it's been found have in common? Mm -hmm. Ports, industry. Ports, industry, yeah. So it's all, so far the infestations have been limited to urban areas where, you know, maybe intermodal centers in Ohio or, yeah, where, where, where things come in um, for distribution. So um, that's actually one, we're, we, at one point we were trying to work with people who worked in warehouses to um, look for the beetle too. So, yes? I just crossed the border into Canada about three weeks ago, actually, mm -hmm. um, at Niagara Falls, and one of the questions the border crossing board asks is if you have cut fire wood mm -hmm. or bringing any woody products, and, you know, there's always been a ban yeah. on plants, animals, mm -hmm. things like that that you don't declare, but they were very specific, you know, firewood, cut wood, mm -hmm. plants or trees. And yeah, that's good. Notify. Yeah, Excellent. That was good. I knew exactly why they were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing if you... We came back? Yes. Hmm. So both ways. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. I know um, there's some other states like Maine and New Hampshire will not allow you to cross state lines with firewood either. Mm -hmm. It's for the same reason. You can't bring it to any DCR campground. 
um, which actually segs into my next slide very nicely. So thank you. Um, so the beetle doesn't really like to fly. They can fly up to a mile. Half a mile is more likely, but they would really prefer just to stay on the same tree their whole lives until the tree can't support any more beetles. Um, so the real risk comes from human induced movement of wood. So for example, firewood, if you go camping or have a summer home and you bring it with you or you heat with home, you get your wood from far away. Um, but also removal of infested wood after maintenance or after cleanup after a storm or hurricane. So the ice storms, the hurricanes we've been having, those can all kind of contribute to movement of the beetle. There's a whole Don't Move Firewood website. They have a ton of little public service announcements and cute things. You can get stuff from them too. So. Um, if you ever would like to help spread the word, that's a good um, way to do it too. So, um, if you saw one of these for the first time, how would you distinguish Asian longhorn beetle from other longhorn beetles or other just kinds of beetles in general? The way it's the intent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The spots are really distinct as well. And the way it's intent, often it's right there. Yep. Definitely. So you're looking at a shiny, shiny black body with very, very well-defined white spots. They actually call this the starry sky beetle in China. Um, the long black and white banded antennae, if you'll notice, the female has a bigger body, but the male has um, a smaller body with longer antennae. So um, hers will usually be about the length of her body. His will be up to one and a half times the length of his body. So if you did get to see one, that would be one way to tell if it's a male or a female. Um, when they are alive, they do have a bluish tinge to their feet. You won't see that on the specimens I'll pass around. They've been um, dead quite a while, so that kind of fades. And the other striking thing about them is their size. They can be up to an inch and a half long in um, body length. So um, this is a mount of a male and a female beetle and also some of the signs of damage, which we will discuss in a minute or two. This one has an Asian longhorn beetle on the left. He's the bad guy. The one on the right, I used to have a good guy label, but it fell off. He's, um, he's not exactly a good guy, but he's harmless. He's called the white spotted pine sewer, and he's native, and he helps decompose um, pine trees. So take a good look because, hint, hint, there will be a quiz on this later. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, and just so you have it while we're going over these slides, I also have, and I have extras of these that I can leave for you in the town offices too. Um, this is the ID card, uh, nice and wallet size, so you can keep it handy. It's got a picture of the beetle. On the reverse, it's got um, different illustrations of the damage, including a sample exit hole, um, an egg laying site, and the frass. Most importantly, though, it has the 800 number that you would call if you found anything suspicious. So we would like you to call that. So you can just take one and pass them on. Thank you. Yeah, that, that number goes directly to our office. So okay. mm -hmm. Any concerns you can call us up? Yep. They're very good. They're very helpful and they always follow up promptly. So definitely. We'd rather hear from you and have it be something else than not hear from you and have an infestation somewhere that we don't know about. So please do call. All right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the life cycle because this sort of goes along with the signs that the beetle leaves behind. So the adult beetles bore their way out of the trees, usually sometime in July. And when in July depends on the number of growing degree days in the season. So we kind of got off to a slow start this year. Obviously, we had a rough winter. Um, that being said, the cold winters don't necessarily slow them down or kill them. Um, it might take them a little bit longer to get to that adult stage, but unfortunately it doesn't, it just doesn't really knock back the numbers at all. So the adults come out in July. Um, they will do a little bit of maturation feeding on the leaves, which is really not visible. It's not like winter moth where there's holes all over the leaves or it might be defoliated. Um, then they mate and the female will chew an egg laying site in the tree and she will lay an egg directly underneath the bark in the cambium layer. She will do that between 45 and 90 times over the course of a season, which for adult Asian longhorn beetles is July to the first frost. So you will not see adult beetles after the first frost. They all die off. Um, in about 10 to 14 days, the egg hatches into a larva. The larva goes through several different stages or instars. And then the following year, maybe two years if it's been a really rough winter, 
uh, the larva will pupate. It's kind of like a butterfly in a chrysalis. And then in July again, the adults bore their way out of the tree and start over again. So even though they do have a fairly high mortality rate as larva, um, it's not enough to keep them from being invasive. So they're just, unfortunately, we don't have any predators here that would keep them in check at a level that would control their population. So. And you're not going to see the pupa, are you? You're just going to see the adult after, after they emerge? Yeah, them. yeah. You'll, you, the only life stage you'll see is the adult, but you can, and you only see them, like I said, July through the first frost, but, oh, he's passing you the... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you can look for the signs that they leave behind at each life stage pretty much any time of year. Some of them are easier to spot than others. So, for example, um, the egg laying sites are what the female leaves behind when she chews into the tree into that cambium layer and lays an egg. The newer ones will be orange. They might be weeping sap, depending on the, the type. Older ones kind of turn to the same color as the tree as it heals itself. Um, the larva, the sign that they leave behind is frass, which is basically a fancy way of saying excrement if you're a bug. Um, and Asian longhorn beetle frass is kind of long and skinny like matchsticks. So um, that's one thing you can look for. A little hard to spot. Um, the easiest thing to spot by far though is the exit hole. So just like the ones on your card, um, they're about three eighths of an inch in diameter. If you were to stick a pencil in one, it would go straight back. If it went in at an angle, it might be something like um, leopard moth. So I have here a couple of wood samples. Um, I know their favorite host is maple, but they will also go after birch. And I love this sample because it's got very well-defined exit holes and an egg laying site on it too. So there's one exit hole, there's the other one. I will leave it up to you to see if you can figure out where the egg laying site is. It looks different than the ones on the slide because the tree's kind of grown and it's changed shape. And then when you're not seeing the beetles is when they are doing the most damage. So the larvae are boring through the heartwood of the tree over the winter, making it look like this. So it's kind of a long, slow death for the tree. They're not girdling the tree, so it doesn't die within a year or two like emerald ash borer, which we'll talk about. Um, it's more a structural weakening over time, so the tree becomes more stressed out and susceptible to other things and storm damage and things like that. So I will pass those around so you can take a look. Um, so again, just a larger slide of the exit holes and the... Um, so, um, we've been discussing host trees a little bit. I did mention that maple is their favorite host. Over 90% of the infested trees that um, have been found during survey have been maples, but they will go after anything on this list. So, um, elm, willow, birch, horse chestnut, the sycamore, um, any of those hosts are, if they get desperate, they will go after them. On the side table over there at the, um, at the end of the presentation, if you would like, I do have some other additional handouts. We've got a tree survey guide, which um, I personally like because it's very detailed. If you didn't have a tree ID book on you, it shows the bark, the leaf, and the fruit of the different kinds of host trees. So pretty much anything on this list is fair game um, for Asian longhorn beetle. So uh, we mentioned in the slide of the neighborhood that was impacted so severely that Asian longhorn beetle only attacks hardwood trees. So they do not go after softwoods like the conifers, the fir trees, the spruces. Um, they also don't attack oak or any of the fruit trees. They have found, if there aren't any maples around, they have found egg laying sites in oak. However, they have never ever found a, an adult beetle coming out of an oak tree. We don't know why, but they just cannot complete their life cycle in oak. So if you're seeing something that looks like an Asian longhorn beetle hole in an oak tree, it's probably something else. There are many, many, many wood boring pests. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we'd, and if the maple right next to the oak is fine, clearly it would have gone for the maple. So um, definitely we, you don't need to go surveying your oaks. If, if the only tree you look at, in fact, when you're out hiking and you happen to decide you want to check your trees is maple, that's totally fine. That actually helps us out tremendously. All right, I mentioned the quiz. So here's a little primer before your quiz. So you're going to need to tell me if it's Asian longhorn beetle or ALB damage or a lookalike. 
So I just mentioned many, many things make holes in trees. Uh, as far as Asian longhorn beetle goes, the holes don't follow any pattern. Um, if you look at the number of holes on this trees, tree, there are many of them, but they're not in rows or any particular shape. Uh, I mentioned Asian longhorn beetle doesn't girdle the tree, so it does not kill it quickly. So if your tree is fine one year and kills over the next, it's probably something else. You might want to have an arborist check it out. Um, if your tree doesn't look healthy, it's always a good reason just to look at it and check it out, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have Asian longhorn beetle. Also, the um, larva, which I neglected to pass around before, um, here's a, a larva and a pupa. The larva of Asian longhorn beetle look very, very similar to the larva of other longhorn beetles, and we have almost 200 of those in Massachusetts. So it's not necessarily the, the best way to tell. So if you're splitting a log and you see a larva, if you want to call it in um, because you're suspicious, by all means, please do. Um, it's just they're kind of hard to identify, so you, you know, don't need to necessarily jump to that conclusion. All right, you ready? Is there a way you can send photos or something? To Definitely. Like a quick ID yes. Or a quick yeah, um, there's a website, and it's, um, it's on the last slide that I'm going to do after my whole presentation. It's called massnrc.org slash pests, and you can just upload the photo. And if we can ID whatever you've sent the photo of right then and there and tell you it's not, we'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. If we can't, it gets sent to the USDA system, um, and they will follow up by coming out and doing a survey or picking up the the beetle that you have or, or whatever, yeah. So definitely, we want to hear about it. All right, what do you think? <laughs> does, it, does anybody recognize that? That is Siegfried the Stegosaurus. He resides at the Ecotarium in Worcester. And in 2010, to help raise awareness, a local artist decided on April Fool's Day to decorate a dinosaur. Yeah. So yes, that is not Asian longhorn beetle. How about this? Could be. Why or why not? Okay, yeah. See how they're all in a row? That is actually woodpecker damage. So if you're seeing anything in a line or some sort of pattern, it's probably some sort of a bird. Um, I had one person tell me a story that they were checking out a tree and the holes were in a square and they were very puzzled by this until the homeowner told them that there had been a suet feeder nailed to the tree, and the bird just went right outside the outside of the suet feeder. So you never know. You can see all kinds of things out there. How about that? Okay. All right. It looks like an exit hole. It does. Um, all of the photos in this quiz were sent to us by concerned citizen sci scientists who had heard about Asian longhorn beetle. Why do you think this one was sent in? Yeah, it passes the pencil test. It looks just like an exit hole. Um, however, it's not Asian longhorn beetle. Um, Asian longhorn beetle only attacks live trees. It doesn't. Hmm? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't go after dead dead trees. Many things do, like the white spotted pine sawyer, for example. Um, and we, a lot of people say this is pine, but if you don't know your trees, you really can't tell what kind of tree it is. So without knowing that it's a host, you really may not be able to, um, to tell. And the other question that I get on this slide is, well, how do you know the tree didn't get infested first and then die? And if you think back to that first tree in that slide, it looks like it was shot up with a machine gun. There are so many holes in that tree, it's a wonder it's still standing. And yet this one, there are only a handful of holes. So if Asian longhorn beetle had killed it, it would be, there would be far more damage. How about that? Yes. Yeah. Why? It's a maple. Yeah, it's, yep. It's, it's, an exit mm -hmm. it's a maple tree. You can tell by the leaves. You've got an exit hole there, another one there, egg laying site, possible egg laying site, another exit hole. Um, so, yes, that is Asian longhorn beetle damage. Also, from the larvae tunneling underneath the bark for a little short distance, it's splitting a little bit. So, that is not a very happy tree. How about that? Maybe. It's hard to tell what kind of tree this is, but that actually is Asian longhorn beetle. That's an egg laying site. It's about a half an inch wide, and when the female beetle chews it, she has her jaws are called mandibles. So she's kind of going like this. So you can see on the edges of it here these little scratch marks. 
So it that is. Hmm? It didn't go too far. No, no, it's uh, no. Nope. So that's just the egg laying site. So she would lay an egg right underneath there. Yeah. Are there no other beetles, native beetles, that do that, that have that sort of well, pattern? there are other things that would look like that. Like sometimes squirrel damage can look almost exactly like an egg laying site. I mean the the program people and their contractors are they make them go through some pretty serious training. Mm. And then if they're on the ground surveying, they look up and they see an egg laying site, they usually call in the climbing surveyors to come verify, because from the ground with binoculars, it's, it's still hard to tell. Do you know what else would make similar damage like that? Um, there are other beetles um, that can make similar eggs, but they're not gonna be on maple. Um, for instance, I believe there's one that, uh, the white spotted pine soil, I believe, even, even lays eggs similar because it is a longhorn beetle. Right. We've, we've seen it um, on hemlocks and things like that. Mm -hmm. But in general, if you're out there surveying maples, you won't see anything exactly like that with those mandible marks. Mm -hmm. Like she had mentioned, there's, there's other damage. Woodpecker holes can look very similar if they're high up. Yeah. Um, squirrel chew. Mm -hmm. Leopard moth galleries. When we talk about a gallery, it's the damage that is formed um, on that cambium layer from the initial feeding of the larva mm -hmm. before it tunnels into the heartwood. So it is going to girdle part of the tree, not the whole thing, mm -hmm. but just that part. And so when that heals up, it's going to leave a bare spot. Okay. <clears throat> so when you're looking up high in your tree, there's moths that can make similar looking damage. Mm -hmm. The slight difference is in the entrance hole. An Asian longhorn beetle is going to go into the center of the gallery, and I don't know if she, I don't think she has any maple logs. No. But it goes into the center and it has a slight C shape to it, whereas a leopard moth gallery will have the entrance hole in the, in the top, and it goes up at an angle. Okay. So when you're looking at that damaged part, if you see the hole going up in, it's going to be leopard moth. Okay. But a lot of times it can be very difficult, and we'll, we'll send in a climber that can climb up. So. Mm -hmm. I told you they're thorough. <laughs> they're very thorough. Yeah, they, they take this seriously. I mean, this is billions of dollars in, in lost revenue and, and economic damage if we just let it go. So we definitely want to um, cut down every infested tree and be certain about that. How about that guy? No, no, no. No? What's he missing? Spots. Yeah. The yep, so no spots and the antennae aren't striped. You know, if, if you've seen my presentation, it becomes pretty obvious what, in a, or any presentation really, what's an Asian longhorn beetle and what isn't. But to some people, they think that any large beetle is Asian longhorn beetle, particularly if they've just heard about it on the radio or maybe they glimpsed it for two seconds on a, you know, a billboard. Um, but so we'd rather have it be called in and be a false alarm than not called in and have it be ALB. So how about that? Um, yeah, kind of, I guess. <laughs> you're, you're partly right there. This is a case of uh, smush first and ask questions later. So somebody went, oh my god, a bug, and stepped in it and then went, gee, maybe it's um, So you can still identify it as Asian longhorn beetle even though it is only half a beetle. Um, you can still see the shiny black wing covers of the white spot and the blue feet pretty clearly. Some people say they could see an antenna, but I think this is just like a broken bit of the, the wing cover there. I don't know where his antenna are. Maybe they pulled them off. I don't know. Um, but this is, we do like getting pictures. We would very much prefer an entire specimen. Um, so if you do see a giant beetle, they don't move very fast. They're not aggressive. Um, Granted, if anything that has a mouth can bite, and if you threaten it, I think I have Googled one or two cases of ALB bites, but has anyone in the program ever gotten bitten by one that you know? I mean, they will bite. Yeah. Um, but if you're careful, you know, you yeah. can let them walk around in your yeah. house. You really want to contain them if you catch one. Yeah. Right? Put it in a jar and freeze it. Yeah. If you freeze it, it's going to you know, kill it. Yeah. So that's, that's what they do when they, they find them. They put them in a jar, they put them in the freezer. This will humanely euthanize the beetle and then make the phone call. Um, if you can take a picture and send it, that helps. If all you have on you is a baggie, you really need to put it in the freezer because they will just chew right through that. I don't have the slide in this particular presentation, but they have one of a beetle that chewed through a metal tag. 
on a maple tree, just right through the metal. So, um, so yeah, so please do call us if you have a beetle, preferably with it intact. Um, so if yeah. you freeze it and you, and you thaw it out, it's dead? They don't, mm -hmm. No, they're not going to come back. No. They don't, um, the, I was once wondering about, um, you know, like, how do they survive in the trees and do the trees freeze? And yeah. um, if you ever want to subscribe to this, I highly recommend it. It's called um, Northern Woodlands Newsletter. And they do all sorts of interesting articles, and one of them was about trees and how they cope with winter and freezing temperatures and how do they avoid cellular damage and things like that. And it kind of was <laughs> eye-opening to see how Asian longhorn beetle would fare in the tree over the winter, um, kind of using the trees. It, the article wasn't about that. It was just about the trees, but I was kind of trying to put two and two together. Um, so, so, yeah, if you put them in the freezer, they will die. Um, but in the tree over the winter, even if it gets down to three, they're not going to, they can still survive. You don't have to put a stick through the heart? No, no, they're not that evil. They're not like zombies or vampires where you have to, you need like a toothpick. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know how they would respond to garlic, but they'd probably just be like, whatever, so, yeah. Um, the, the, unfortunately, you just, you have to cut the trees down. That's, there's nothing else you can do. So how about that guy? We're almost done with the quiz, I promise. You're probably done, but the abdomen Yeah. So that's the western conifer seed bug. That probably looks more familiar from the back. Um, that first picture, obviously, they're taken on screens. They like to move in with you in the winter. Once it gets a little cooler, they move really slowly. They're like in slow motion. Um, people call them a stink bug. They're not a true stink bug, but they will smell if you smush them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. People say they smell like turpentine. I don't have any conifers in my neighborhood. It's all hardwoods, so I actually hadn't seen one until I was giving a presentation here. There was one walking across the table. So. Last year, the building that I work in was—they were everywhere, mm. and they would actually, when you walked outside, they'd fly ahead. Oh, wow! They probably want to hit you right they're, in. They're everywhere. <laughs> they're quite abundant at certain times of the year. Yeah. yeah. When, when we're on regulatory and we respond to these homeowners' calls, when these are emerging or the white spotted pine sawyer that she talked about earlier, I mean, we'll, we'll have hundreds of calls within a month or two. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I've I've been there. Every uh, this is what happens. Okay, so the phone rings. The admin picks up. Hello. It's probably white spotted pine sawyer. Does it have one spot in the back of its neck? Yeah, that's a white spotted pine sir, but thank you for calling it in. Please keep looking. Click. Five minutes later, same thing. This is what they did all day around April, May, particularly more early weekend. People are confused? Yeah. See why in, okay, well, I just gave away the answer to this one, but, um, so what do you think? Yeah. 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 That is the white spotted pine sawyer. Um, same rough size and shape as Asian longhorn beetle, but it's got that one white spot on the back of his neck there. Um, he lacks the blue feet, and he's a little bit more mottled. His white spots aren't as distinct. Plus, whereas Asian longhorn beetle is smooth and shiny like a bowling ball or patent leather, this guy's more rough. Um, but obviously the size and the shape, people see it. And if they haven't seen a, an actual specimen or some sort of presentation where it's laid out for them, um, they wouldn't know. But still, we'd rather get all the Sawyer calls than miss an actual Asian longhorn beetle. So. He, he does. He looks very, very similar to Asian longhorn beetles. Striped antenna, body size and shape. Most of the ones of these guys I've seen are a little bit smaller, but um, they are roughly the same it's size. Like textured paint versus gloss. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yep. That's a good way to put it. I like that. I might borrow that from Thank you. Textured. Textured. Yeah, textured. Okay. So, uh, what are we doing to eradicate the beetle? Uh, delimiting the infestation, defining where that regulated area is where people aren't allowed to move wood out of, um, surveying the trees inside that area, cutting down the ones that are infested. Um, as Kai mentioned, um, responding to reports. If they don't send in a photo or we can't determine from a photo um, what the homeowner has sent in, they will go out there. Um, they remove and grind the stumps of the infested trees wherever possible. Uh, disposal of any yard waste of host material or tree work that's been done has to happen within that regulated area. And anybody doing that work in the regulated area has to attend compliance training, which is kind of like my presentation, but they go into more of the um, regulatory aspects of it. So 
and you would know. So if you were going to hire somebody to do work in the regulated area, they would have a decal on their truck with a number on it. They'd be listed on the state website as being um, certified. And after they're done with this first round of survey, they actually need to do it again just to make absolutely sure that they have found every infested tree. So it takes a while. So it is a cooperative eradication program. So my agency, the Mass Department of Ag Resources, works together with the USDA and the DCR to um, survey, um, cut down trees, replant trees. I do the educational aspect of it. And they also work together with the cities and towns so that everybody is on the same page. Um, obviously, if trees are going to get removed, sometimes if they're in a public area, they need to go through tree commissions and things like that. Uh, but the most important part of the equation is you, the members of the public, our citizen scientists, people who are outside. Um, if you are hiking, bird watching, just generally spending time outside, we don't ask that you take two hours to do a survey. Um, that can get, you know, a little bit, a little bit old after a while. But people who survey the trees for a living, I have great respect for you guys. I don't know how you do that all day, but it's it's very impressive that you do. So. We just ask that while you're out doing your outdoor activities, you kind of keep an eye out. If you notice anything, give us a call. Um, so I keep mentioning um, the regulated area. What I mean is it's 110 square miles. It includes all of Worcester, Shrewsbury, Boylston, West Boylston, about half of Holden, and a small segment of Auburn. Um, the infestation was discovered in 2008. It was already at least 15 years old at the time of discovery. So it took us a while before we found it, which is part of the reason we're at 110 square miles. Um, as of last Saturday, they had surveyed 4,640,451 trees. And this is just the initial delimitation survey to um, make sure that these boundaries are as they should be. If they do find Asian longhorn beetle, Within a mile and a half, they, um, they quarantine within a mile and a half of an infested tree, which is further than the beetle can fly. So Kai, did you want to give an update on any surveys that are going on anywhere else, anywhere near here? Or I mean, what, what you said is correct. Uh, we've, we've worked our way through the majority of this entire quarantine zone. We're just wrapping up the last few units, because this is broken down into areas, zones, and units make it easier for us to uh, accomplish. And there's only a few remaining before we've completed our entire um, first survey. So the delineation. Like she said, if we happen to find infested trees that are very near the border, we would then bump it out a mile and a half further just to make sure that that's giving us adequate distance to survey all of those trees that could potentially be infested further out. And you are surveying a little bit outside of that area too, right? So our, our regulatory staff will also um, do what's called a level three survey, which is outside, sometimes outside of our quarantine zone. We'll generally go to some of our compliance agreement holders, um, facilities, wood yards, firewood processors, um, areas of high risk that wood may have been moved to. Um, Previously, and just we, we need we don't know where this beetle could be, so we want to make sure. So sometimes if people see us in a different town, that's most likely what's going on. <coughs> We're just completing a level three survey just to look for any possible infested trees. What's your methodology for that? Do you do transects? Do you do plots? Do you um, just branch out and check every tree, or do you? Is, what's your what's your science behind your methodology? When we're actually surveying within our quarantine zone. Yes. So, like I mentioned, so every town is going to be a zone, so Worcester, mm -hmm. um, then, uh, well, an area, then a zone, and then a unit. So these could be different geographic sizes. It could be a couple blocks. Mm -hmm. It could be as large, it could be a large woodlot. Um, we generally, we don't want to cut across property properties, um, split properties. We try to keep them whole. And we will literally go through entire woodlots or residential properties mm -hmm. and serve, survey them and in their entirety. So we will go on, um, you know, we, we always knock and, and announce that we're there to survey. Um, and once we begin the survey, we're going to identify every single host tree species on that property. 
So every maple, every birch, mm -hmm. every willow. Okay. Um, we're then going to measure it and inventory it. So we have um, mm -hmm. a record of every survey that's, that's done. And most importantly, after it's recorded, we're going to then inspect it from the ground with binoculars, looking for any signs of this damage. Exit holes, egg sites, the frass, the galleries, anything that can key us in that there is Asian long beetle infested into that tree. So. Mm -hmm. How many people are working in your program? Oh, we must have, I mean, in, in we have supervisors, we have our ground staff, we have climbers, which are actually in a separate office now, but in entirety, probably around 100. Um, and then we also contract out um, <coughs> other, other companies to complement our surveys and, and uh, essentially do the same thing we're doing, survey and look for the beetle, um, but they're contracted under the federal federal contract. You know, it's a private company doing uh, work for us. So, so in these towns and areas, you will look at every single maple, willow, elm, Absolutely. every single one of them? Yep. Absolutely. And you can tell from the ground with binoculars whether or not that tree might have you can. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a learning curve. I guess curve, what I'm asking is, what are the chances you missed one? I mean, there's always a slight <laughs> risk. Um, we, we go through assessments. <laughs> yeah, we, we go through assessments to, to make sure that we are, you know, adequate at spotting this damage. Um, we will set up courses with, um, we'll make, sometimes make fake damage that we have to find just to test people. And we have to pass these assessments before we're actually allowed to, to work, um, as, as well as the contractors that are employed under federal contracts. So our, our rate has been very, very high, higher than old numbers that have been mentioned um, in other papers. For you mean other rate of fine? Yes. Are you, are you well, them? Well, well, not necessarily our, our rate of fine, but our, our rate of not missing any. You know, okay. we're not going to find anything if, if it's not there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But yeah, we're we're very successful um, when it comes to actually surveying those trees. Are you finding more beetles? Or are they recently? We have uh, we found a few back in the core area of Worcester. Yeah. Um, so you know, possibly a few trees got missed, and like Stacy had mentioned, um, one beetle can lay you know sixty to ninety eggs. Mm -hmm. Can re reintroduce the population. That's why it's important. You know, once we survey your tree, we're not deeming it um, not infested forever. We're gonna be back in the future to do another inspection to make sure that you know Asian longhorn beetle hasn't reinfested that area. So after you cut them, cut the trees, how do you? What's your control? How do you control? Them getting loose or shaking eggs loose, or is it, is it a time of your thing? Or Absolutely. Away or so, as yes. Stacy had mentioned, the emergence is generally you know around July and up through October would be about the latest. Mm -hmm. um, and so, everything we find during the year, we want to make sure that that tree is removed and chipped up before emergence mm -hmm. because the life, the majority of the beetle's life cycle is going to be inside the tree. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about them, really. Can you just highlight like the original site in, in Worcester? Um, roughly. You know, I live in Salem, and I know. There's what, so 290 you can yeah. it's that it's right top one there if you want. Mm -hmm. so this, this is like, Indian well, Lake here, yeah. right around Worcester Country. And that's where yeah. 290 meets 190. So it's right. going to be somewhere right in this that, area. That's it's going to be the, 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 the heaviest yeah. infested area. Right. Yeah. Yep. Just yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, pretty it's, cent it's pretty centralized mm -hmm. for, for as far as Worcester. Right. Right on the Worcester Country Club area, right? And that's, uh, right? that's fairly close. Yeah. Yes, we definitely had plenty of that. So, where Burn, Burn Coach <laughs> Street was. So, where your yard yeah. is, where your chip yard is, there. That's north. exactly that's where, the, the, where the, the original tree was, essentially? Or? Yeah, right across yeah. the street. They're near Ground Zero, yeah, yeah with that, yeah. that chip yard. Right there. Yep. So, that's Ground Zero. Mm -hmm. So you can see that from 190, if any of you travel okay. north on 190 from 290. Mm -hmm. You'll see our disposal yard, there's a large uh, tub mm -hmm. grinder there, it's yellow, mm -hmm. and some other machinery. Mm -hmm. You'll see it chip piles from the ground up trees, and maybe some logs if, if they haven't been ground up yet. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, th those are not always infested. We also leave that disposal yard open for our 
um, compliance agreement holders, tree companies and landscapers who work in our quarantine area, we will actually accept post-tree um, stumps and logs to be dropped off there. That way they don't have to risk violating the quarantine. Right. It gives them a safe place to drop that and leave it. And we'll take that free of charge and grind it up to the store. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Growing. <laughs> Yeah. Chipping yeah. Really yeah. I have a slide on that. Yeah, I'm sure she's going to yeah. cover a lot of this. Yeah, I, I actually need to speed up a little <laughs> bit because we're. Um, I don't want to yeah. interfere with your your actual your conservation commission meeting. So just quickly, um, traps are placed in and around the quarantine, uh, the regulated area, and they help direct survey areas. They're not meant to reduce the beetle population, but allure with beetle pheromones and plant volatiles attracts virgin female beetles to the traps, that way they're not sort of spreading the problem. Um, they come around and they check them every couple of weeks, take any beetles that they find, um, and they need to survey within a certain area of that trap. Um, we were talking a lot about the wood chips. Basically, they need to be ground up to less than an inch in each of two dimensions. Um, and they've done studies that show that at that size, basically nothing is going to come out of the chip or alive. Um, if by some miracle it did, uh, the larvae don't crawl to a new piece of wood. Um, they're just going to dry out and die. They need a very, very specific set of conditions to complete their life cycle, so they can't do it in the pile. So at this point, the reason I can bring these is that they're deregulated. I can take them anywhere I want. Um, they have in the past um, sold them, and they use the money to fund the replanting <laughs> effort. So in one case, they were sold to an electricity generation company that burned them. But in another case, they were sold to a town and um, used as mulch. So this is just the replanting, which is spearheaded by the DCR. They do only replant with non-host species of trees so that we don't um, make the problem worse. Boston was declared eradicated officially on Monday. Woohoo! So the former area of infestation was about 10 square miles in um, Boston and Brookline. The beetle was discovered um, and the infestation was only two to three years old at the time by a groundskeeper at Faulkner Hospital who had just been to a training and knew what to look for. And we are so glad he called it in. Literally, he called it in about a week before the beetles were emerged. There were adult beetles that were about to bore out of the tree when he called. Uh, they came in, they cut down six infested trees. They surveyed almost 150,000 trees and then we're able to declare eradication. And we're very, very fortunate because this is right across the street from the Arnold Arboretum, which has been surveyed numerous times. They didn't find anything. So this is our major success story, and it really highlights the impact that one concerned citizen can have. I mean, if, if we didn't catch this for 20 years, I don't even want to think about what I would be saying to you right now. So um, we are, are very, very fortunate. So we need you all to look at your trees. Um, very quickly going to run through emerald ash borer. Again, you don't have it here. Um, same thing kind of as the Asian longhorn beetle. It was discovered here um, in 2002 in Michigan, and it's thought to have come over in the 1990s on that solid wood packing material before those regulations were in place. Um, if anything, it's more destructive than Asian longhorn beetle because it does kill the trees a lot more quickly. Um, it's currently found in 22 states in Canada, Connecticut, it was found in 2012, Concord, New Hampshire in 2013. Here in Massachusetts, it was found in Dalton, which is Berkshire County, uh, in 2012, and Essex County just this past November. Uh, it does only go after ash trees, but it will go after all species of ash. So 10%, um, only 10% of the ash in that, of the trees in Massachusetts are ash, but of those, 90% are concentrated in Berkshire County. Um, so currently, all of Berkshire County and all of Essex County are regulated. They're under quarantine. You cannot move um, ash material out of those areas. Um, so this is just a map of all of the detections uh, nationwide and the federal quarantine zones, um, I believe in blue. So obviously Connecticut, about half of Connecticut's under quarantine. Um, this one does fly a lot further than Asian longhorn beetle, I believe up to three miles. So it does spread on its own, but it is also helped out by the movement of wood. So it's not just Asian longhorn beetle being the reason that they won't let you move wood, it's basically any wood boring pest. 
Life cycle, kind of similar. You'll see the adults from May through September. They lay eggs, hatch out into larvae. The larvae pupate, come out again in, in May, um, and emerge May to June, and keep going through September. That being said, you're not likely to see an adult. They hang out in the canopy. Um, you probably notice that they're bright, shiny green, and if you're looking 25 feet up in a tree, you're probably not going to see them. Um, the larvae feed on the inner bark of the tree in that cambium layer, and they do girdle the trees. So that's why EAB trees are killed much faster than ALB trees. Uh, what we would like you to look for are signs of emerald ash borer rather than the insect itself. So for example, you might see this blonding, which is actually due to increased woodpecker damage. So the tree gets stressed out, that draws more woodpeckers to the tree, and there's enough damage as they go for the larvae that it actually strips the bark and makes it, gives it this whitish or blonde look. Um, if you were to peel away the bark, you would see these S-shaped galleries filled with frass. EAB frass is really kind of compact and small, it's not like ALB frass. Honestly, you could look for exit holes, um, but if they weren't highlighted on this piece of wood, I would not be able to see them. My supervisor went to the North Andover infestation and looked at some of the trees up close and she couldn't find exit holes. Um, so they're not, unlike for Asian longhorn beetle, they're not the main thing we want you to look for. Um, we'd really look, prefer that you look for the blonding and um, canopy dieback on your ash trees. So canopy dieback is kind of like that. Because the tree is stressed out and trying to save itself, it also produces some of these epicormic shoots. Um, and so just to give you an idea of what emerald ash borer looks like, I do have a specimen here of the beetle and the larva. They're really, really tiny. About seven of them can fit on the head of a penny. Um, they're shiny, shiny green. They've got this purple underneath their wing covers with some coppery coloring there too. Um, a couple of look-alikes. The two-line chestnut borer looks almost exactly the same, except he's a little dark. He's got these two lines. And you might see a six-spotted tiger beetle. That's the one we get the most calls about. They are normally found in the leaf litter and the detritus at the bottom of the tree, though. So you won't usually see them up, whereas EAB is up. Um, so we're doing many of the same things or similar things that we do for ALB. Um, they use these purple panel traps. They call them Barney traps. And there is a lure in them, but the EAB is also just attracted to that purple color. So they fly into it. It's very, very sticky. If you see one, don't touch it. You will not get that stuff up your hands for like three days. But don't ask if I know that. Um, you can, in some cases, they will strip the bark from the trees to purposely stress out the tree and create a population sink, drawing in the EAB population in the area and then cutting that tree down. Um, we, are, we do have some biological control options with a couple of different kinds of parasitic wasps. Um, and unlike Asian longhorn beetle, if you catch it early enough on, you can treat the tree with a systemic insecticide to save the tree. And you can always check out emeraldashboard.info for more information. So, sure. That previous slide, is that human, that ring, is that? Yeah, that's a person they've cut around the tree to purposely stress it out and draw EAB to it, and then they cut down the tree and, and chip it out. Mm -hmm. So it's known as a population sink. Or, yeah. It, yes, a person did that on purpose. And in some cases, they'll do it if they suspect emerald ash borer but haven't confirmed it and they want to confirm that it's in an area, they'll do that too. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so for your part, what you can do is you can check for emerald ash borer just like you would for ALB when you're out in the woods. Check out your ash trees, um, look for dieback, look for blonding. If less than a third of the canopy has died back, you may be able to save the tree. It's going to depend on things like location, aesthetic value, economic value to you. If the tree's in the midst of power lines and the company has already cut it back to the point where it's so lopsided it's practically falling over, it may not be worth it. But um, if you can save it, doing so earlier on is better. If you can't, it's always better to cut it down earlier on. Otherwise, you have this dead tree, which could um, be a hazard. The other thing that you guys can do, and I do have a sign-up sheet in the um, back there. If you want to sign up for our Wasp Watchers program or you know a scout group or a school group that is looking for a summertime project, summer camp, whatever, um, we train people. That would be my colleague, Greg. He does general forest pest outreach. So I will hook you up with his email. 
And you're just looking for these little native non-stinging wasps. They're completely harmless to humans. They make these nests in packed sandy areas like ball fields and parking lots. And you get to run around with nets and capture these wasps and monitor the prey they're bringing back. One of the things they bring back is emerald ash borer. So that's actually how EAB was discovered in Connecticut. So we do, we are always looking for participants for these programs all over the state since we really don't know where emerald ash borer is. Other than for trapping, there's really no federal funding for it. So it's always up to the state or the municipality for the homeowner to take care of the tree. Yes. Two years ago, I remember. Jennifer? Well, yep, yeah, Jennifer Foreman Orth. We were doing this. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. I, I actually looked in South Pro. Oh, perfect. Find it. Yeah, if not every town or city has the appropriate um, sort of habitat for these wasps. Yeah. Baseball fields. Right? Yeah. 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 Baseball fields. Baseball fields, yep. Baseball fields. Yeah. That's the same. Okay, so the wasp hunts bucrested beetles and emerald ash borer is a bucrested beetle. So what we want, the wasps are good and they hunt the beetles which are bad. You are looking for the wasps and then if you find a nest, we put you through a training and we train you how to monitor the prey that the wasps are bringing back to feed to their young. And if that prey includes emerald ash borer, then we know we need to do further surveys in the area. Yeah. So it's a good wasp. We definitely, it kind of looks like a hero here holding up the emerald ash borer, as you can see. Um, all right, so just to quickly sum up, if you find anything, please get a specimen. Keep it whole if you can, but we'll take a smush one if that's all you've got. Um, picture is worth a thousand words. You can always report it and upload your photo directly here. Someone will get back to you soon with a yay or a nay or a we don't know. If it's a we don't know, it gets passed on to APHIS and they will follow up with you, or if it's a yes, I guess. You can call the number on your handy dandy ID card. And I don't think I passed out the Emerald Ash Borer ID cards, which are, are similar. They also have a phone number that you can call on them. And some of the different signs. Is that a different number? It's a different number. Yeah, it's different programs. The number on the ALB card is specific to Massachusetts. And the number on the EAB card, I believe, is nationwide, but I think it routes you to your local office, I think. I think, I think so, yeah. Um, you can also call our pest hotline, which is on the nifty little um, post-it notepad we have over there. So yeah, just report it somehow. Even if you don't remember all this and you Google something and you find a place to report, please feel free. Um, oh, that's really dark. Anyway, we are on all these social media, so MassNRC slash pests, Twitter.com slash MassPests, and Facebook at Asian Longhorn Beetle. So look us up. Um, that is me in the costume, regrettably. I'm not out for hire for birthday parties, um, but uh, sometimes I am at different events in costumes. So if you go to any of the camping or RV expos in Worcester in like February, I'm usually there. Um, so definitely check us out. Keep your ID cards on you. Keep an eye on your trees while you're just out and about. If you know of any other group that could benefit from a talk like this one, please do sign up on my sign-up sheet and list your contact info and their contact info. And most importantly, report it and don't move firewood. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Wait, you What's going on with this? I, I hear about is that? It's, what, everywhere? I mean, yeah, I know. Is it, yeah. it, is it, wear a hat <laughs> unless you want frass on your, in your hair. Um, they have a wide host range. They've been found all over the state. Usually they're kind of worse in the eastern part of the state. Yeah. But you see those little inchworms coming down on the, the threads. That's them. You notice the holes in the leaves or complete defoliation in really bad cases. Yeah. There's just there's nothing we can do. They're here. They're established. There's no federal or state funding for them. No attempt to do I don't, do you know of anything? Because, uh, no. I, I mean, you can, at certain stages of the life cycle, spray your trees or, like, use a biological oil or something, a horticultural oil, but um, it's kind of on, on the homeowner. It's are, are, they, are they... Gypsy moss? What's that? Gypsy moss? No. You, winter you, you moss. Seem in, you seem in the headlights of your car in the wintertime. Like, yeah. You, you think it's, it's, up they they hang out on your house, articles near the lights. Yeah, I, right. I feed them to my cat, but that's just me. She's an indoor cat, so are I figure she needs something to. Are they in 
think of like the and how to Yeah, the I mean, the so, like I said, it's worse down the cake. I don't have in this presentation because it was kind of limited time, yeah. but um, yeah, if if your tree gets completely defoliated, it can survive one round of defoliation and relief out. Yeah. But if they attack it again and do the same thing, the tree only has so much energy stored yeah. up, so they can kill a tree with repeated defoliations. Now their population is growing, I guess. Are they spreading? Or they well, yeah, I mean, they're one of the ones where if it gets really cold, it can kind of knock them back, but not to the point where they're, like, gone. So they will just rebuild their population. So, yeah, we're kind of just up a creek without a paddle, unfortunately, with that. I'm sorry I don't have better news. But, yeah, unfortunately, it is what it is. Thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you very much.